Well, here we are again. This is lecture three of the first week of our course, Apologetics 6323, Ministry Issues Related to Apologetics. And we're going to uh, take our first chapter, our first look at this book. I'll cover my face up partially here for a moment so you can see it. And it is uh, a book called Five Views on Apologetics. Uh, for a course like this, where we're looking at different models for apologetics, this is really a perfect book. Uh, I'm so grateful that the book was, uh, was published. And the uh, editor of the book, Steve Cowan, is actually a very good friend of mine. He and I have known each other for about 15, oh, about 20 years now, I guess. <clears throat> and have worked on a couple of small projects together. Um, but Steve, at some point, decided to jump on the bandwagon of these multi-viewed books. I think he's done another one as well on the church. But uh, the multi-viewed books, just a word about them for a moment, are helpful books. Uh, Zondervan has published some of these. Robin Holman has published uh, several. Zondervan has published more, I would guess. Uh, IVP a few years ago was involved in the publication of multi-views or perspectives type books. Uh, I like these books, which is one of the reasons why I've edited four of them and wrote a chapter for another one. Uh, just a little plug there for, uh, for the future in case you're interested in some of the issues that I have dealt with on the, in these volumes. But this is a very helpful work on apologetics. It, this format makes itself uh, very, very convenient for looking at a variety of different perspectives on apologetics, which is part of what this course is all about. I don't know how this course was originally uh, designed by the uh, folks who are in administration at OBU, but they may have even had this book in mind <clears throat> as they were thinking, thinking about this. And so we're going to look at the first chapter of this book. Hopefully you'll scan the introduction a little bit. And the first chapter is called Classical Apologetics. It is the simplest in many ways of the apologetics uh, approaches. And it's written by one of the best advocates of classical apologetics in America today, a scholar by the name of William Lane Craig, known as Bill. Bill is someone whom I've met. We're not friends, uh, but we've met at conferences on a few occasions. And uh, he normally has a little group of followers who are with him, young uh, theologians, probably his students, who uh, hang on um, Bill's every word, and they should. Uh, Bill is a guy with two doctorates, one from uh, Germany at the University of Munich, where he studied with Wolfhard Pannenberg, a very famous uh, theologian, German theologian, and relatively conservative theologian as well on the German scene, which is perhaps not saying a whole lot. But in this book, Craig, or in this chapter, Craig takes us through what I think is a very helpful introduction to what classical apologetics is. And when you first begin to read the chapter, you're probably taken a little bit not uh, taken a little bit aback, because it begins not with arguments but with the Holy Spirit. And this is part of who Craig is. He uh, came out of the Pietist kind of tradition. Uh, the same way that Grudius did. We looked at uh, his book in a previous course, and Grudius began as a pietist, then became an in intellectual dealing with apologetics issues, and the same thing is true with Craig. So uh, he begins with the Holy Spirit, and he talks about here the uh, difference between knowing our faith and showing our faith, knowing Christianity to be true and showing it to be true. That's found at the top of page 28. Uh, you might want to circle those words and put a little asterisk off to the side with the idea that this is one of those little uh, distinctions that probably will show up on a quiz <clears throat> somewhere. Hopefully you, you uh, will learn how to recognize the things that I recognize as being quiz-worthy. That's a quiz-worthy uh, kind of distinction right there. And so when he deals with the issue of knowing Christianity to be true, he begins with the whole concept of the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, which makes him pretty much in the standard strain of Protestant uh, approaches to knowledge. John Calvin was 
uh, one of the first Protestant theologians really to develop this idea very carefully. Even in Calvin's uh, book four of the Institutes, where he talks about assurance, for him assurance is something that comes primarily from the Spirit. It's only buttressed by evidences uh, of the working of Christ in our lives. Uh, but this is where he begins, and it's a good place to begin. Uh, page 28, the first full paragraph, he gives us what I think is his thesis for the chapter, and that is the methodological approach, which I shall defend in this essay, is that reason is the form of rational arguments and evidences, uh, in the form of rational arguments and evidences, plays an essential role in our showing <clears throat> Christianity to be true, whereas reason in this form plays a contingent and secondary role in our personally knowing Christianity to be true. And so this is why he begins with the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And then page 29 gives us a whole section in this chapter on the role of the Holy Spirit, which is a very helpful chap uh, very helpful section uh, as I read through it. Uh, and I've read this book when it came out years ago, but going through it a, a second and with some of the chapters even a third time has uh, strengthened my conviction that it's a very helpful study. And so um, this is where he is headed with all, with all of this. Now, he introduces a term a term to us in uh, on page 33, <clears throat> and the term is defeaters. This is an important concept, an important, an important term in dealing with apologetics because uh, the fact is that even though we may, may begin our Christian life with the conviction that Christianity is true and the Bible is true and God is real and all of those things, uh, that we have experiences in our lives that conflict with that. And uh, I found it very refreshing that somebody who is considered one of the great apologetic geniuses in American uh, Christian life today, Bill Craig, would admit that this was, is true of himself as well. If we're honest with ourselves, we will all admit this to be true. Pastors, uh, Sunday school teachers, deacons, uh, those of us who, who don't necessarily have a leadership role, all of us have encountered moments of doubt. Uh, we think at times, well, if God really were there and he really loved us, then how could this have taken place? So we have these moments of defeat, but then he talks about the defeater of the defeaters. And this is all on the top of page uh, 33. And there's a, a wonderful sentence, which I will not take the time to read for time's sake at the end of that first paragraph on the top of 33 that you ought to look at and put another little, little mark by it there as possibly a paragraph uh, that might show up or an issue that might show up again on a quiz. Then he moves on uh, to deal with the role of rationality. And he begins by talking about something that we'll get into later in the semester in more detail, and that is what beliefs are properly basic. And here he's going to agree with Alan Plantinga. Now, Plantinga is one of the uh, founders of Reformed epistemology. And if you look back at your book, at the cover of the book or in the, the uh, table of contents, that's the fifth of the models that we're going to deal with out of this volume is Reformed epistemology. And so <clears throat> what, what Craig is able to do is he's able to take ideas from other apologetics traditions and incorporate them into his own. This is part of what classical apologetics is all about. So he gives a little space to plan to get here. Later on in the chapter, he will actually have a kind of excursus on planting it. Uh, on pages 36 and 37, he talks about two ways of understanding reason. And one is the magisterial understanding of reason and then the ministerial understanding of reason. He points to Luther for this. This is at the bottom, bottom of 36. It says Luther distinguished between these two approaches and he finds this helpful, which I do as well. This is a piece of Luther thinking that um, like a lot of other Luther insights have been passed down to the church. Uh, just a brief word about Luther here. We don't normally look to Martin Luther as a great systematic theologian, but he had wonderful insights. 
wonderful intuitions. Some of them wrong, but many of them right. A magisterial use of reason is the idea that reason determines all truth. And of course, Christians don't hold to that. They uh, would hold to what he calls a ministerial understanding of reason, where uh, reason come, becomes an assistant to faith. Uh, then in page um, 38 and following, he talks about showing Christianity to be true. And he talks here, and I'm going to cover this quickly because I've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, he talks here about the distinction between rational approach and an evidential approach, which uh, the classical understanding makes use of both. And by the rational approach, he's talking about the theistic proofs for the existence of God. If you were with us in the previous course where we read Grudius, <clears throat> we looked in some detail at those proofs. And so for him, the classical approach begins there, begins by proving the ex existence of God. But as we would know, uh, proving the existence of God or simply believing in God, or as some uh, person in your, in your church might say at some point, well, I believe in the man upstairs, is not enough to be saved. There must also be a, a belief in Christ as the atoning work, as the uh, whose work of atonement purchases for, uh, purchases for us our salvation. And so uh, in the classical approach, you begin with establishing the existence of God. And what, what Craig does, and he shows this later in the chapter, and does it in his own writings as well, is this is kind of the twofold thrust of his work. The Kalam cosmological argument, other versions of the cosmological argument, and then evidences, and specifically for him, it's the resurrection. He's published many works on the resurrection. If you want to get deeper into the chapter, oh, let's see here, around page um, uh, 48, 49, 50, and so on, he will list for us many works on the resurrection, defending the resurrection, and many of those works, oddly enough, are his. And I have in my own personal library quite a collection of Craig's works on defending the resurrection. And so this is this is a, what we might call a well-rounded approach that incorporates uh, arguments for the existence of God, theistic arguments, arguments for the resurrection, and then the role of the Holy Spirit. So I commend this to you. By the way, I haven't talked about the responses to the chapter, but you ought to read those, as in all of these chapters.